and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. You ever wake up and you just sort of ache all over, your neck aches, your back aches, your body aches, you've got a headache, you didn't sleep well, you don't feel well, you feel tired? We're going to be spending most of the show talking about a condition where people's muscles ache, their tendons ache, their shoulders ache, they don't sleep well, they feel tired. What's going on? What's the cause of this? Is there treatment? How effective is the treatment? My guest is Dr. Fred Wolf. Dr. Wolf is a board certified rheumatologist and he deals with fibromyalgia and aches and pains every day. He'll be answering our questions. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt and I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on The Dr. Bob Show. Later on, we'll be talking about breast cancer. Early detection is so important but there are ways that we can actually prevent breast cancer. What are those? And heart disease 101. Do we spend enough time talking about the basics of heart disease? After all, it's the number one killer in the United States. A lot of information for you. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Fred Wolf, board certified rheumatologist. We're going to be talking about aches and pains. Fred, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I've got sort of a stiff neck from a high school football injury, and it sort of aches in the morning. Is that what we're talking about today? I don't think so, Bob. Fibromyalgia is a real different um, situation. So what is fibromyalgia? Fibromyalgia is defined by the American College of Rheumatology as widespread pain encompassing all four limbs and areas of the body. It is persistent. It is associated with what we call tender spots. There are 18 of them. 11 out of the 18 have to be positive. And then with that constellation, each patient, you make a decision about the word fibromyalgia. Tell me about those 18 spots. What kind of pain? Do they hurt anyway, or you have to touch them to hurt? <clears throat> Many patients hurt without being touched, but when you put pressure, and there's an exact amount of four milligrams per meter squared, yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> then <clears throat> over these spots where the tendons and muscles join the bone, <clears throat> so it's around the elbow, the shoulder, the back of the skull, over the areas of the hips, the knees. When you put that pressure, the patient says, it hurts. Whereby with you or me, I can put that amount of pressure. <clears throat> it's uncomfortable, but it doesn't hurt. Can you reproduce that pain if you have a patient with fibromyalgia and they come in on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of one week? Can you reproduce that pain in those same areas all three days? Pretty much so, pretty much so. It's not something that comes and goes. It's something that the patient, unfortunately, has to live with all the time. Any other problems? They ache, their muscles ache, their, their <clears throat> insertions ache. Uh, anything else that they've got going wrong? The majority of patients have a constellation of other problems. They have trouble sleeping. They don't sleep well at all. They wake up many times during the night. They may have trouble thinking, remembering. There's just a large constellation of, I don't feel good. Is this all secondary to pain? If people have pain, uh, the brain keeps you sort of awake during the night. If somebody's got fibromyalgia and they've got pain in these 18 spots, um, is it the pain that's sort of making them in la-la land but never getting good sleep? Is that what's bothering them? We think that's true. Patients with fibromyalgia have a increase in their spinal fluid of a substance P, which is a chemical that modulates pain. And so it's bathing their brain and their spinal cord and their nerves on a regular basis. So they never get this rest. That same substance is seen in patients with chronic pain as well. So there's something unique about these patients, they're not crazy. 
they have a real problem. They, do they produce more of this substance P or is this they do. They, substance P perceived differently in their brain? The substance P, there's a higher level of it if you measure it, but it allows the brain to interpret pain more severely. So it must be a terrible, a terrible condition to have. It is, it's, it's a hard way to live on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there a way to diagnose it? Can you measure substance P? Can you take a biopsy of the tissues? How do you make this diagnosis? You make the diagnosis, unfortunately, clinically. There is no wonderful little magic blood test or x-ray, so you can't biopsy one of these. It is true that if you do a spinal tap and get spinal fluid, you could measure substance P, but that's a very invasive procedure. So most of the diagnosis is made on the basis of widespread pain, 11 out of 18 of the tender spots being tender, and their history of this has been going on for a while, is gradually worse, they never sleep well, they just aren't functioning well. More common in men or women? More common in women. What age group? Uh, starting in probably the 35-45 age group, not very common in older women or men, and not very common in the uh, teen and preteens. When they present to the rheumatologist or to their doctor, they just say, I ache all over and don't feel good? They say, I hurt. Everything hurts. My husband came up and hugged me, and it hurt for him to hug me. My daughter came by and yanked me to go see something at the store, and it hurt me. Um, anything make that hurting worse? For instance, stress, or changes in weather, or changes in sleep? Uh, the changes in sleep, yes, and patients with fibromyalgia sleep very poorly. We'll talk a minute when we talk about medicines of how we can address that. Stress aggravates. Uh, the weather may not necessarily aggravate the fibromyalgia as much as it does some of the other forms of arthritis like rheumatoid. Differential diagnosis, somebody aches all over. Could it be some other illnesses? Uh, I'm thinking of thyroid, Lyme's disease, uh, other things that cause aches and pains. The job of the rheumatologist is to make that diagnosis and part of making the diagnosis is ruling out they don't have rheumatoid, they don't have lupus, they don't have Lyme, they don't have thyroid disease, they don't have abnormalities in the blood because fibromyalgia doesn't. So you've got to make sure you're not overlooking these to make that diagnosis. Is that easy or hard? It's a lot of work. I would think it's a, a lot of work. You have to be very careful and very thorough. <clears throat> so the history or the physical is most important? I think, the, I think they're very equal. As I said, the history of widespread pain is one, and the tender spots are two. Uh, finding large swollen joints, probably not fibromyalgia. Finding skin rashes or hair loss, not fibromyalgia. So the physical is very important in excluding these other diseases. When, uh, is there a family history? Is it hereditary? Does it, do you pass it down? Unfortunately, there seems to be an increased incidence. If a <clears throat> parent has fibromyalgia or a grandparent or a first degree relative, there is a large percent increase in your chances of having fibromyalgia. There's some studies now going on showing that there's some genetics with looking at the serotonin, the pain modulators, and there seems to be a, a group that we can actually document that and show that it does seem to run in families. If somebody has fibromyalgia, is there a good treatment program for these patients? Yes, there is. And that's what we're gonna be talking about. If you have symptoms of fibromyalgia or if you have the diagnosis, there is treatment. Stay tuned, we'll find out what it is. But first, let's look at a patient who has fibromyalgia and see how they did on treatment. Hi, my name's Carrie and I have fibromyalgia. Most of my life I had some joint pains, various from my uh, feet to my ankles to my jaw. And so eventually after several procedures, I went to the doctor. She gave me a 
a pamphlet and asked me if the trigger points matched up and they all matched up and so that's when the process started in about 1999. There's a lot of people that truly um, are debilitated by this disease. Whether that, you know, I'm lucky because I don't have daily symptoms or weekly symptoms, but there are some people that truly can barely function with this disease. For the most part, I feel well. Um, I have flare ups, but they're, as the years have gone on, they've actually gotten further apart. Um, when I was, I had two pregnancies, and during both pregnancies, all the symptoms went away, which was amazing. Um, then they came back full fledged about eight weeks postpartum. But luckily, they don't seem to last too awfully long. Um, last time I had one, I just drank lots of water, did an Advil routine. But exercise is the key. Um, whenever I have an exercise routine, my symptoms always go away. Um, there's certain diets you can follow that will help, um, and then some medication, but I found that exercise is truly the only thing that will help me ultimately is, is that. We're talking with Dr. Fred Wolf, board certified rheumatologist. We're talking about fibromyalgia, more common in women, causes muscle aches and joint aches, not inside the joint, but at the insertion of the joint. There's 18 pressure points that are reproducible, uh, causing pain. People don't sleep well, they don't feel well. It's difficult to perform in society. Is that a good a summary that's of it? an excellent summary, Bob. Uh, let's talk about treatment because I, I think that's the exciting part. There is things we can do for these people. How do you start? First, you tell them they're not crazy. Second, you tell them there's hope. And then you lay out a program, and the program is exercise, good sleep, and some medications to help with that. Now, if, if uh, I ache all over, I really don't know. Sometimes I like to exercise I ache, but most people don't say, I can't exercise, I ache too much. And if people don't sleep well, they say, well, you know, I don't sleep well, how are you gonna help me sleep? So carry on, tell me about this. Well, you start with the concept they've got to sleep. <clears throat> and if you do sleep studies and look at their brain, they never get down into good sleep. There is an old, old drug that's been on the market as old as you and me, called amitriptyline. Oh yes, I remember that in the old days. It's a great drug still, it helps rest, it helps sleep. <clears throat> and after a couple of weeks of getting a little bit better sleep, then you work on exercise and you start gently and gradually. So you wanna get them to walk, you wanna get them to stretch. Uh, they can use a bicycle, a treadmill, an elliptical, whatever they wanna use. Yoga? Yoga's great. We like Tai Chi. The Arthritis Foundation has a very good Tai Chi program here in East Tennessee. Um, so there's some options there. Then once you get a little bit of exercise, then they recognize that the discomfort around the joints is not quite as bad. And as long as you can keep pushing them and moving them forward and forward, they can see some progress. If they have a stress, if grandma has to go in the nursing home or Uncle George falls over dead <clears throat> and they get stressed and they don't do any of that for a few days, then they can backslide. Your job is to keep them from going all the way back down. When we exercise, you talk about walking. Walking exercises predominantly the lower extremities. Right. A lot of the pressure points are upper. Do we have to wiggle and lift weights and do arm exercises? We use the elastic bands. Uh -huh. We use two and four pound weights depending on where they are. We use some of the ski and elliptical machines to move upper extremities. So yes, we move all four extremities because if you remember, we said it's in all four quadrants. Yeah. And you've got, you have pain in all four quadrants. We've got to move all four quadrants. Um, twice a week? Seven days a week, is there a pattern of exercise? I push for as much as I can get. <laughs> uh, the studies suggest that if you can get in five days a week, you really can make a dent and improve their quality of life. 
So we start at five minutes, and then we go 10 minutes, and then 15 minutes over a period of time, slow right. and steady? The idea is to get up to 20 minutes or more. At 20 minutes, there is an endorphin change that you can measure if you do blood test <clears throat> that's equivalent to about five to 10 milligrams of Prozac. And so we really push them for that first 20 minutes. You know, it's sort of the runner's high, you have an exercise, I feel good, and people with fiber. You, you know, do. it's a devastating illness. So to feel better, they must um, ha reach a point when an exercise kicks in that they must really say it's really helping. They're willing to say it helps. It takes them longer to get to that exercise high of the well-toned athlete. Now, exercise, sleep, amitriptyline helps them sleep better. Exercise gets all four quadrants yes. uh, moving. Uh, what else? There are some medications. It's important to understand that we're beginning to know some of the chemistry behind, which shows that the serotonin, the um, chemicals between the brain and the nerves need some help. There's some drugs now that are approved for fibromyalgia. The uh, pregabalin is an excellent example of a drug that really does make a difference. Um, gabapentin is sometimes used, which is a member of that class of drugs. These are really medicines that help the neurotransmitters in the brain and the spinal cord deal with pain. The, the first medicine I saw on television a lot was Lyrica. Right. And the, the thing I liked about it, here was a medicine that gave people with this difficult illness some greater hope. Now, is there a better one or every patient responds differently? Every patient responds differently. As I said, we get some patients who we give the amitriptyline and get the sleep and they start exercising. That's as far as you need to go. Others, you start there and they just can't get over that hump. You might move to the pregabalin, which is the Lyrica, or the gabapentin, which is the Neurontin type drugs. Um, but you start here and you build up. The key thing you're trying to avoid is keeping them off of analgesic pain medicines, which is the easy way to cover pain, sure. because that's not a long-term answer. Can we interfere with substance P, which is elevated? Do, do, do any of these <clears throat> manipulate that? Are you working on serotonin? What, what are you doing? We, I, we don't have the substance P magic number yet. Can you see it coming? Uh, five to seven okay. years out. Hey, that'd be wonderful. But um, right now we're doing the serotonin, the catecholamines, um, those kind of chemicals, and making some good progress just treating with that route but it doesn't negate the exercise and sleep. And then again, as I mentioned, stress is, is important. So helping people understand how to deal with pain, um, that helps them move forward. How do you do that? Do you have to have psychological <clears throat> assistance in there to teach people? I use a team. Uh -huh. And I use the psychologist who can help patients understand there's some hint that people who've had physical trauma in the past are more prone to this. So getting a psychologist to help you. I use the physical therapist. I use the exercise therapist because they can help patients. Tai Chi. Tai Chi is great. So all of this really makes life more bearable and fun. Fred, it sort of excites me. What you're talking about is really working at the whole patient. You work from a mental aspect, from a physical aspect, from an emotional aspect. You know, you get them busy, you get them active, you treat them appropriately, and you've got steps of medicine. It must be exciting to see somebody so miserable become more functional and feel better. It is, it really is, compared with what we had 15, 20 years ago, which was one drug and not a lot of knowledge about the disease. Please. Fred Wolf, you're a great teacher. I always oh, have you. the best time with you on the Dr. Bob Show because you Teach everybody, including Dr. Bob, when you come on. You're very kind. Hope you come back with us. I will. Great show. If you've got fibromyalgia, if you ache all over, if you don't feel good, know that there's treatment for you. You have to access it. Now, for questions from you, the viewer, 
We'll be talking later on about um, other problems that will be important to your health. Breast cancer, it can be prevented. And heart 101, we don't spend enough time talking about regular old heart disease. Stay tuned, a lot of information for you. I want to thank Dr. Fred Wolf. Wonderful discussion on fibromyalgia. There is good treatment. Be sure that you seek it. And now for questions from you, the viewer, that I think will be important to your health. Question number one, Dr. Bob, I'm very concerned about breast cancer. My mother had breast cancer at an early age. Can it be prevented? Oh, that's a good question. What are the risk factors for somebody getting breast cancer? Well, number one, being a female, men get breast cancer. 1% of breast cancers are in males, but 99 females. So being a female, getting older is a risk factor for breast cancer. Genetics can be a risk factor. We know that there are some genes, we call them BRCA, that's breast cancer one gene and breast cancer 2 gene, these protect women from getting cancer, but if there's a mutant in those genes, and we can measure that with blood work, then the chances of getting breast cancer uh, go up with the brick a one go up about 60%, and go up 40% with the other mutant. So we can have genetic risk factors that cause a problem. People that get overweight, that's a risk factor. People that don't exercise, that's a risk factor. And people that drink alcohol on a regular basis, and maybe a little too much, that's a risk factor also. So there's lots of things that we can do to prevent breast cancer. Now, early detection, if we can find breast cancer early, then success for five-year survival is really very good. So we want to be sure that we do our self-breast exams monthly. We need to be sure that we get our mammography. Uh, different recommendations from different cancer groups, but basically I think starting at age 40 sounds like a reasonable time to me. And then every one to two years after that would be a time to get your follow-up mammography, unless there's a close family member that had breast cancer at an early age, then you need to start getting your mammograms at an early age. Now, to prevent, we exercise. We eat properly. Uh, people that gain weight and allow themselves to gain weight will have increased incidence of breast cancer. People with dense breasts, the breasts are made of fibrous tissue, fatty tissue, and glandular tissue. As we get older, the glandular tissue that we have there to feed babies gets less and less, and the fatty tissue gets more. It's the fibrous tissue and the glandular tissue that sometimes makes a breast dense. If that's the case, mammography is more difficult to interpret, and you may need ultrasound. So yes, there are some things that you can do. Exercise, stay in shape, don't drink much, don't smoke. Recent studies show smoking can certainly cause a problem. So. Take care of your breasts. Know that one in eight women that reach the age of 70, that's 12% of the population, will have breast cancer. You can prevent it, but if you can't and you're going to get it, find it early. Question number two, Dr. Bob, my husband says women don't get heart disease like men do. I don't think he knows what he's talking about. Well, that's a good question. Men and women have different heart disease. Uh, it is different. Women, when they get heart disease, heart attacks, coronary artery disease, it's more severe than when men get their coronary artery disease. Men get it at an early age. What's the difference there? The coronary arteries supply the muscles in the heart. The coronary arteries are reasonably sized vessels that cover the entire heart. Those coronary arteries, if they get cholesterol deposition will narrow the opening of the arteries and those get closed in and that's what happens in men It's those large coronary arteries. Now, those large arteries become very small arteries and the smaller arteries branch out into even smaller arteries. And that's where women have their problem. It seems to be in the small blood vessels that get out into the very ends of the heart muscle. And when those vessels get damaged, 
it's much more serious. So women do get heart disease, and when they get it, they get it worse. The chances of getting heart failure after a heart attack are greater in women. The chances of dying of heart disease are greater in women after a heart attack. So, keep your blood pressure under control, keep your cholesterol under control, be sure that you exercise regularly, take care of yourself, and make it where heart disease is not part of your life. That's all the time that we have for this show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Remember to exercise. Exercise helps your heart, helps lower the cholesterol. Uh, it helps lower stress. It helps lower your blood pressure. It helps us be skinnier. What more can you want than to exercise on a regular basis? Eat proper foods. We need to be eating less fatty fried foods, less fat, uh, fast foods, and more good whole grain foods with lettuce and vegetables. Get eight hours of sleep. Know that that eight hours of sleep will make you perform better. You'll be healthier. Your whole body will be healthier. You'll be happier. You'll think better. You won't get behind in your work. You'll function better. You'll get all those jobs done that you need to get done. And most of all, what is it we like on the Dr. Bob Show? It's that giggling and that's laughter in your life. Be sure that you laugh a lot. Smile. Be happy around people. They'll be happy around you and you'll both Stay healthy.